All right, everyone, welcome to another episode of the Twimmel AI podcast. I am your host, Sam Sherrington. Today, I'm joined by Ram Sriharsha. Ram is VP of Engineering at Pinecone. Before we get going, be sure to take a moment to hit that subscribe button wherever you're listening to today's show. Ram, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me, Sam. It's great to be here. Uh, thanks for coming on the show. I'm looking forward to chatting with you. We'll be talking about all things vector databases and retrieval augmented generation. Uh, before we jump into that, though, I'd love to have you share a little bit about your background and how you came to work in AI. Uh, great question. So uh, in another life, I did a PhD in uh, theoretical physics. Uh, from there, I moved uh, to different fields. So I kind of spent some time in Goldman uh, working in finance. Uh, from there, I moved to uh, the West Coast to join Yahoo. This was around uh, 2010. And I stayed there until about 2014. Uh, that was my first exposure really to uh, big data systems, uh, large scale data processing and uh, machine learning. At Yahoo, I worked in different areas around machine learning, eventually ended up in Yahoo Research, where I was focusing on scalable machine learning. From there, I left to, uh, you know, over time, join Databricks, where I spent some time working on Spark, but also starting new initiatives like Genomics and so on. Uh, from there, I went to uh, Splunk to head the machine learning research group there. At some point of time awesome. in this, in the course of doing all these things, I wanted to start my own uh, company. And I was thinking about uh, doing that when I uh, reached out to Edo, uh, who is the CEO of Pinecone. And we started talking and we realized that we are kind of trying to solve very similar uh, overlapping problems. Hmm. And uh, that's kind of how I ended up teaming forces with Edo again and joining Pinecone. It, it strikes me that a lot of our audience probably has no idea how huge Yahoo was in terms of developing big data infrastructure and some of the early uh, kind of commercial uses of machine learning in support of search and ads and so many things. Absolutely. I think, uh, you know, some of the best uh, work in uh, cloud systems, um, um, machine learning, online machine learning, and so on, had kind of come out of Yahoo. The people who worked at Yahoo, who eventually went to uh, places like Google and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, so yes, it's been uh, certainly formative for the whole industry, but for me personally as well, it's one of the uh, it's 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 really the place where I learned a lot of lot about the basics that were needed to kind of work on big data systems, machine learning, and so on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you know, we'll be talking, of course, about vector databases and, and why they have suddenly become so interesting. But you mentioned um, connecting with the, the founder of the CEO of Pinecone. Um, does this predate RAG and LLMs and, and all of that? Has Pinecone been working on vector databases uh, for a while now? Yes. So Pinecone has been working on vector databases for uh, several years now. Uh, okay. I myself joined Pinecone about uh, two years and six months or so uh, back. Okay. Now, uh, while RAG and LLMs are kind of uh, becoming very popular now, the the research and uh, development on RAG and uh, LLMs have been happening for a while. Mm -hmm. Language models have been getting bigger and bigger for a while. So uh, it's it, it was only a matter of course that they would end up here. Uh, so we were aware of the LLMs. We were aware of the trends in language models. We were thinking already about how uh, vector databases could be used in these sort of flows and so on. But uh, the industry as a whole has started taking off really early in the last year mm -hmm. uh, around these topics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So elaborate on uh, on that from, from your perspective. You know, when you think about how vector databases have, you know, suddenly come into the limelight and, uh, you know, people who wouldn't have thought about deploying a vector database previously are now trying to figure out what this thing is and how do I use it? Like, tell us about the evolution of that from, from your perspective and, and, you know, is the attention being placed on vector databases, uh, you know, is it appropriate? Is it, uh, uh what's the role of the, the vector databases and what pe folks are trying to do now? That's a great question. Uh, I think before, uh, talking about vector databases, it might help to set the context a little bit. Yeah. So, uh, you know, chat GPT and uh, models like that are what we call large language models. Mm -hmm. These large language models are really just sequence to sequence models. So they take a sequence of text and produce a sequence of text, right? 
And now you can use this for a variety of tasks. You can use this for summarization. You can use this for search. You can use this for uh, literally, you know, new new use cases are coming up on a daily basis. Uh, what has made them very powerful is that these models are really large. They, in some sense, embed the world's knowledge in their parameters. So they are trained on a lot of data. They embed uh, both the structure of language itself as well as the ability to reason in their parameters. Uh, and then they can be used. What makes them really powerful is that now they can be used across tasks that they weren't specifically trained for. Okay, And this is what really made them very powerful. Now, the best way to think about la large language models these days is that they are uh, the intelligence layer or the orchestration layer uh, for emerging generative AI applications. Okay, What I mean by that is you can use them to actually orchestrate uh, intelligent AI uh, flows. Uh, you can also use them to reason about things. Okay, mm -hmm. um, So they act as the intelligence and the orchestration layer. But something is missing if you just have an LLM. If you just have a large language model, you're missing what we call the knowledge layer. Okay, So uh, what you're missing is the actual knowledge required to perform a lot of knowledge-intensive tasks. Right. That's really where vector databases come in. Now, large language models, to some extent, embed their embed the world knowledge to some extent in their parameters, right? So it's not like they don't have any knowledge. They do have world knowledge. They do have the ability to reason based on that knowledge and so on. But uh, they what they lack is the ability to access accurate, uh, you know, relevant knowledge, mm -hmm. and that's what vector databases provide. Now to to discuss how vector databases provide this, you kind of need to take a little bit of a step back and talk about the other piece of this, this uh, entire workflow, which is retrieval, okay? So if you talk about uh, retrieving relevant, accurate knowledge, now this is something that people have been doing before. This, this used to be something we used to do even before there were large language models, right? If right. you think about <laughs> search engines like Google, if you think about uh, uh, any sort of a search engine uh, over text documents, for example, that's what it does. What it does is you take those documents, you uh, put them in this sort of search engine, then you can ask questions about it. You can uh, you can search over it. What It does what's called retrieval. And the field of information retrieval is very rich, very well understood in the classic sense of retrieving text documents based on keyword matches. And this is something that's uh, very, very well understood. But over the last maybe ha uh, half a de decade or so, there has been a new type of retrieval that's already been happening. And vector databases have already been used for that which mm -hmm. is what's called dense retrieval uh, or retrieval using vectors. Mm -hmm. So instead of doing just keyword matches over whether your corpus contains keywords that match your query and how relevant are those keywords to the, the query itself, this used to be the traditional focus of information retrieval. Uh, what's happened uh, recently over the last five, seven years is that people have realized that if you take those documents, if you embed them using these uh, neural networks, uh, what we call embedding models, and you put them into something like a vector database, now you can search over them much more, uh, much better, meaning your searches give you much more relevant context, uh, much better retrieval can be achieved uh, doing this. And what do vector databases really do here? They act as the evolution of search engines, right? So what they do is, instead of searching over uh, text uh, by breaking up text into chunks of keywords and then creating posting lists and then somehow searching over them. This is what search engines used to do. Mm -hmm. In vector databases, retrieval works differently. What, what happens is that you take this same text, you chunk it up somehow. Each chunk is embedded with a neural network to produce an embedding. An embedding can be just thought of as an array of floats, an array of uh, floating point numbers, right? Mm -hmm. And you take these embeddings and put them in a database, like a vector, uh, put them in a vector database, and vector databases are uniquely positioned to answer the following question, which is given a query, you encode the query as well. And now you have a query vector. And you can ask a vector database, give me the most relevant candidate document vectors corresponding to this query vector. And this, this particular interaction retrieves documents for you that are most relevant to the query and does what's called semantic search, semantic, semantic retrieval. Uh, so, Modern information retrieval already does this, which is modern information retrieval uses vector databases as the core of retrieving accurate, relevant knowledge. It's been my observation that 
you know, as LLMs and interest in ChatGPT and the like have rapidly expanded the the field of AI, that the connection between RAG as an approach to getting a chatbot to work and search and information retrieval is not really fully appreciated by folks. Um, yes. And the folks uh, that I've seen have the most success in getting, you know, beyond a, a RAG demo to something that's actually useful have a lot of experience, previous experience working on search and relevance types of problems. And all that yes. knowledge comes into play in making a chatbot that a user is actually going to want to use to use because it's, it is, you know, relevant and timely and, and provides the right information. Do you, you see some of the same things? Absolutely. So in fact, in fact, all of the, all of this work that has gone into retrieval, uh, relevance, ranking, and so on is what is being used along with large language models to connect, to give them knowledge, right? Mm -hmm. So when we talked about it, we said large language models really don't have knowledge. The knowledge comes from retrieval mm -hmm. and all of, that's why you're finding that the people who are able to, uh, use retrieval augmented generation, RAG workflows the best are people who are really, uh, invested in doing the best retrieval. Mm -hmm. So put that another way, you can think of, you can think of a, a chat bot that's based on RAG as doing, you know, executing a search on your documents based on a query, retrieving or pulling out the results that are most relevant to that query. And then the role of the LLM is just to summarize that and make it, you know, present it to the user. And so yes. If you don't do a good job on that retrieval, you've got like a garbage exactly. in, garbage out type of problem, and the chatbot's not going to be able to produce useful results. Absolutely. Uh, it's even more interesting than that, which is, mm. remember I told you that uh, LLMs have been trained on large amounts of world knowledge. Mm -hmm. You could take the same world knowledge, put it into such a vector database, and if you do retrieval really well, you're making the LLMs better even on, on the knowledge that they were already trained on. Forget hmm. about the knowledge they had no access to, like your your own documents or some corporate uh, uh, legal documentation, or things that they would never have access to, right? So and even on knowledge that they already have access to, retrieval actually provides better results. And so to maybe put that into to context, what I'm hearing you say there is when you're using an LLM and retrieval, you've got, you know, you're, you're talking about two algorithms. One algorithm is a, kind of sequence to sequence next token prediction algorithm. And the other is an embedding based information retrieval algorithm. And you're essentially saying that embedding based information retrieval is better than sequence to sequence at knowledge production. Is that too strong a statement or is that? Yeah, I think the best way to say it is that the two used together, the sequence to sequence models like LLMs used together with information retrieval through a vector database is strictly better than using LLMs by themselves, or, mm -hmm. e or even fine tuning LLMs to do something, right? So mm -hmm. purely just retraining LLMs on your data doesn't provide you as much of a value as using an LLM in the context with a retrieval engine like vector databases. Mm -hmm. So this is what's called RAG. RAG really yeah. is the combination of the two. And, and that turns out to be the best way to provide knowledge to uh, uh, these sort of knowledge intensive tasks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I alluded to this earlier, you know, you can go online and search out, you know, RAG demo and, you know, independent of your language or framework or database of choice, like there are tons of, um, you know, code walkthroughs and blog posts and things like that, that can uh, help you, you know, create a demo of this. Like it's very easy to, to demonstrate, but that's just the kind of the beginning and delivering something that you would want to put in front of your users is a lot more complex. Can you talk about some of those complexities and some of the challenges that you see folks running into? Yeah, I think there's a multitude of complexities. Some of them are just on the infrastructure and kind of the scalability side, which is it's it's one thing to create a demo with a few hundred documents or a small number of documents and kind of do retrieval over that. Mm -hmm. Doing retrieval over billions of vectors is an entirely different problem, right? Mm -hmm. And that's kind of why uh, some... People like you know, uh, people like Pinecone spend uh, most of their time uh, building and perfecting vector databases because doing this at scale is very very hard. Mm -hmm. The other thing is that uh, 
outside of uh, outside of simple demos, your corpus evolves. So people are adding documents, deleting documents, uh, editing them, redacting them, and so on. And being able to take the latest information and make it available available for this sort of a rag workflow mm-hmm. is again a very hard problem. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is again where this is also where the database part of vector databases comes in because in 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 this sort of flow, it's acting really like a database. Okay. And in essence, you're synchronizing your enterprise data stores with this embedding store. Exactly, exactly. And sync is historically really challenging. Very challenging, but particularly challenging for vector databases. I think traditional databases have gotten really, really good at doing this and kind of keeping their indexes fresh and so on. Mm -hmm. Vector database indexes are very, very challenging to keep fresh. Uh, In fact, very few people have cracked that problem. Why is that? How do you keep these? Uh, I think the, the biggest problem is that it's easy to keep an index fresh if your index can be built incrementally, right? Okay. For vector databases, your uh, very few algorithms exist mm. that actually build indexes in- incrementally, right? Because in some sense, uh, when you put a document and encode it and put it into this sort of a database, you can't just incrementally, uh, you know, add connections to the rest of the documents in some small region of space. Mm-hmm. Because if you do that, uh, when a query comes, the query doesn't has no idea that there is a new document in this region of space it has to probe. Right. Mm-hmm. So either the query has to scan everything for it to know that, or the query is going to miss that document out. And mm-hmm. neither of those are good. Right. If the query has to scan the entire region corpus, that's actually computationally intractable. Right. Uh, whereas if a query, uh, you know, is only looking at the places that it already has somehow indexed or pre-computed, it's not going to know that a new document was added here. So mm-hmm. that process of keeping these sort of uh, vector indexes fresh is fundamentally a hard problem. Right? Okay. And this happens to be a hard problem for every known vector vector search algorithm out there. It's also where we spent the last good half of a year, uh, actually close to a year, thinking about and solving and figuring out. Okay. And are these problems, like, is this research frontier problems? Like you're implementing, you know, cutting edge algorithms, search algorithms, or um, are they engineering problems? This is uh, equal parts, both research and engineering. So, okay. uh, you know, we uh, the, the way kind of typically it works, at least in Pinecone, but in general, I think also is that we uh, we are pretty, pretty much at the cutting edge, uh, researching things and uh, testing it out on lots of data sets, uh, figuring out what works, what doesn't work. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then when we feel confident enough that we have something that works for the majority of the use cases and provides a lot of value, we start engineering and we start building. But at the same time, we are continuing to research. The, like something like keeping indexes fresh and so on, is a is will continue to be a research problem. There is a lot mm-hmm. to do over the next few years to build world class vector databases this way. But we know enough to be able to provide a lot of value today. So it's it's really striking that balance between research and engineering. Mm-hmm. So, recapping kind of where we are with regards to challenges, there's these fundamental infrastructure challenges associated with scale. There are challenges associated with keeping your indexes fresh at, at scale. At scale, yeah. There's a couple of other challenges, by the way. Yeah. There is challenges around just cost, right? A lot of generative AI workflows today, or if somebody is thinking about building a generative AI application, mm-hmm. uh, they they have to worry about cost because a lot of these applications today are actually very expensive. Mm-hmm. Solely because of their because of hitting uh, an expensive inference endpoint, or are there other reasons? Exactly, it's it's part part of it, right? For example, OpenAI endpoints. Actually, OpenAI has done a lot to reduce the cost per token, mm-hmm. but even then, it's still very expensive. Mm-hmm. And then you have these uh, open source models, and uh, you know, I would call them uh, today at least weaker models, uh, which are cheaper, mm-hmm. but they're weaker, right? So for knowledge intensive tasks, people obviously want to use the best models out there. Mm-hmm. Uh, here again, you can make weaker models more powerful by adding more context to them and by actually leveraging vector databases and so on. Mm-hmm. So we spend a lot of time trying to figure out how do we make these uh, cost-prohibitive applications today 10 times cheaper mm-hmm. so that you can unlock new use cases in a way that you couldn't before. And the last part I missed out in terms of the question you asked was, this is infrastructure and cost, but there is an even bigger question, which is quality. Mm-hmm. Now, Historically, LLMs have struggled with hallucination. They've also struggled with things like attribution, right? So faithfulness. Are they actually faithful to the documents that they have knowledge of? Or are they faithful to the context that you provided to them and so on? 
measuring this and making sure that uh, you are building RAG applications that are actually correct and, and giving you uh, answers that you can be confident about. I think that's one of the big challenges as well. And even here, vector databases and RAG and so on can help significantly. So these are all I would consider equally important challenges. So Ron, those are the high level challenges that folks are running into. A couple of uh, more in the weeds things that I hear about a lot are the choice of embedding model and the chunking strategy. And I guess there are a lot of these little things that someone has to, these decisions that people have to make as they uh, build and deploy RAG applications. But what is your sense of how important these are. There seems to be some controversy out there as to whether these are key considerations or secondary considerations. That's a great question. Uh, so uh, first of all, they are key considerations. I think what's happening right now is that people are kind of reaching out for things that are easy at hand, right? Which is always the case when initially you're trying to build applications that you're trying to get off the ground. Uh, for example, embedding models that uh, if you're using OpenAI for, uh, for your LLM, kind of makes sense to use their embedding models and maybe the latest embedding models. Uh, that's that's what we see often, which is people are just mm -hmm. using the things that are easy at hand, which makes absolute sense. Uh, however, the choice of the embedding model is very important. Uh, it's actually important in multiple ways. One, uh, smaller, cheaper embedding models could actually do the same job, in which case you're kind of overpaying a lot. Uh, so it's important in that sense. In another sense, embedding models that are fine-tuned for specific things that you, uh, you're trying to do can actually help a lot. So again, uh, the choice of the embedding model is pretty important. Okay. I would say more important than that is actually chunking strategies. So uh, how, you, how you go from text to vectors is probably one of the biggest parts of uh, making the RAG workflow uh, or, or improving the quality of the RAG workflow. Uh, so I would say there are two big parts to improving the quality of a RAG workflow, which is how do you go from documents to vectors, which is where chunking strategies come in. And there's a lot, many ways to think about it, but fundamentally, yes, chunking, chunking strategy is one of the most important things you could get right in this workflow. The other one is how do you, once you get uh, you know, relevant passages or relevant pieces of documents and so on, what do you feed to the language model itself? Do you just put it all together and feed it? Do you do something more on top of it? Do you re-rank? How do you re-rank? Uh, basically, the second stage after retrieval is, becomes very important as well in this workflow. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so with all that in mind, from a challenges perspective, talk to us about what's happening in the, in the vector database to accommodate, you know, these new styles of applications and the accordant challenges that have emerged that folks are trying to, to overcome? Absolutely. So first of all, we just released uh, what we call Pinecone Serverless, which is uh, which basically unlocks an entire new set of use cases. So up until now, vector databases, unlike traditional databases, were very rigid. So uh, you know, if you go to the pod-based architecture in Pinecone today, you have to pre-specify the number of pods that you use, and you have to pre-understand how much data you want to put in there. Every time you go beyond that, you have to kind of reshard and re, in some sense, uh, reshuffle the data around. Uh, all of this is very expensive. So you've got to make these kind of fundamental infrastructure clustering type decisions before you even know like how far you're going with this exactly. app and what you need to you know, what you're going to run into. Exactly, exactly. And if your use case changes, you have a serious problem, right? For example, if you want to take the same data and try to use it for an on-demand use case, now you're paying 1000x more because you're only querying on demand. You're not querying all the time. So you're having these things sitting there and taking up memory and space and cost that you don't, you don't need. So depending on your use cases, you would have a lot of inflexibility in the past, you would have had a lot of inflexibility in the past mm -hmm. in how do you best leverage vector databases. Uh, now, traditional databases have solved this problem over the course of uh, the last 30 years. Vector databases are just catching up. And Pinecone took a very big step in this direction with uh, Pinecone Serverless. The other thing that uh, we, are, we are doing here is, remember I told you that uh, you can actually improve LLMs on their own knowledge by putting that knowledge into a vector database. Mm -hmm. 
this again unlocks uh, 10x cost reductions for generative AI applications and so on. But this again only becomes possible if the cost per query is very cheap. So if you have if you have to pay a lot to run a single query that uses, I'm only putting my most important data. You're no longer going to think about <laughs> right. exactly. You're not going to put a billion vectors in mm-hmm. there, right? So uh, what we have done over the over the past year is worked on how do we rethink vector databases so that you can achieve 10 to 100x cost reductions across a variety of use cases. Secondly, you can you can make it very flexible. People can throw in their data and think about use cases later because we know that use cases are going to evolve. We know that people are going to find new use cases for this data and so on. You don't want them to think about all of that up front, mm-hmm. right? It's it's very inhibiting for uh, generative AI workflows. Mm-hmm. So that's what that's what we've done. And to do this, we kind of had to reimagine the vector database itself. We, you know, traditional approaches don't work. Mm-hmm. And so, what does what does that reimagining entail? Like, what? How did? Well, I'm making some assumptions about the architecture, but assuming it was a traditional monolithic architecture, like how does that need to shift to yeah. become now serverless? That's a great question. So, uh, all vector databases prior to us releasing Pinecode Serverless, they operate on this what's called the search engine architecture. Right, so which is your data is split up into a bunch of shards. These shards contain a subset of your data indexed, always available, which means it's on these machines that between a combination of RAM and uh, SSD, they're kind of always up and running. Mm-hmm. Now, this makes sense when you're running like tens of thousands of queries per second, which need to touch your entire corpus. Right, if you if you're doing that, then yes, that architecture kind of makes sense. Mm-hmm. But if you're running queries on demand. Or if your queries are not touching the entire corpus, which for a web scale corpus, a single query is not going to touch your entire corpus, right? And you don't want it touching your whole corpus. Mm-hmm. Uh, for scenarios like that, now this becomes an extremely expensive workflow, right? And this is what customers of Pinecone are also finding because Pinecone was also using the same architecture uh, in, in our pod-based architecture. So the first thing you have to do to make these sort of uh, workflows, the emerging generative AI workflows, as well as uh, many other workflows that customers at Pinecone do, if you want to make them 10x cost effective, you kind of have to decouple storage and compute. Okay. You cannot have all of the storage for the index sitting close to compute all the time, right? Now, this is something that uh, traditional databases have started doing really well over the last several years. So if you're familiar with Snowflake, if you're familiar with uh, you know, uh, Spanner and systems like this, they are, they are great and they've taken decades of uh, database uh, learnings and figured out how to make how to separate storage and compute mm-hmm. so you can drive down costs for using those databases right what we needed to do was to rethink how to do that for vector search mm-hmm. because remember i told you that vector search has this fundamental problem that every time you're trying to update an index you kind of have to have in some sense a global view of the index yeah okay at least in existing algorithms you have similarly all existing algorithms that you're familiar with whether it's hnsw whether it's files whether it's practically anything that anyone does today they hold the entire index between memory and local SSD. Okay? Okay. In fact, most algorithms up until two years back weren't even using disk. They were all memory-based. And memory is very expensive on the cloud even mm-hmm. now. right? Uh, but even disk-based systems are actually very expensive because there is no way to page anything from a cheaper storage. They have to, you have to maintain everything on local SSDs. And on the cloud, you don't have the fungibility of SSDs you know, being decoupled from compute or something. Mm-hmm. When you get a machine on Amazon or uh, GCP, you're getting uh, you know a uh, lot of SSD, lot of cores, lots of RAM. That's the whole box that you get. Right. There is no fungibility even with the uh, SSDs. So the best way to drive cost savings is to not is to really decouple storage and have it in some cheap storage like blob storage. But the moment you put things in blob storage, you have to get very efficient at incrementally indexing that thing, mm-hmm. incrementally pulling out only the parts of the index that queries care about. And this requires fundamental re-innovation in, in how vector search even did, works. Mm. And that's kind of what we did. Okay? Mm-hmm. So the, I would say that the core of the innovation is around reimagining vector search in such a way that you can actually decouple storage and compute and page parts of the index on demand so that queries don't have to look at... Basically, the cost of the query is no longer the cost of the whole data under management. Mm-hmm. It's only proportional to the cost of the parts of the data that the query even needs to look at. Presumably, you're still doing this on the cloud, and you, but you're just using different primitives than you were before. Maybe before you you were using large machines with lots of SSD. Now you're using what? 
Uh, no, so it's not just the machines that are different; it's the algorithms themselves that are different. I get that. Before, what we used to do was we would take all of those, the entire index, preload them, and, or even keep them fresh and keep them loaded uh, onto these big machines. Right. Today, what we can do is we can still have these big machines. Okay. But now they are only loading the parts of the index on demand. They're caching the parts that uh, have been retrieved and found frequently used. So that the frequently used parts of your data are actually cached and are, uh, and so you can have very low latencies and so on. Okay. But then you're not paying the cost for all the data that uh, is not being touched. Yeah, that's the core innovation. Got it. Got it. Yeah. When you mentioned you mentioned blob storage and it, that made me think that data was being pushed to S3 now as opposed to online uh, it is. storage. Okay. Yes. Exactly. It is. And but the trick is in figuring out what parts of the data do I need to keep close to my compute. Right. When the queries need to be answered. Yeah. And so is this things like, um, you know, predictive query optimization and that kind of thing? So uh, I think that what we do is basically when you create this, when you index or re-index or when you keep your indexes fresh and so on, mm -hmm. you want a way of partitioning them, right? In traditional databases, you're familiar with range partitioning. You're familiar with different ways in which they can slice up uh, ranges of columns mm -hmm. so that you can say that if I'm getting a query for, let's say, uh, timestamp greater than 100. I know that the range I need to look at is everything greater than 100. I don't have right. to even look at data that has timestamp less than 100, right? And you do this by creating these, uh, breaking up data into chunks. Each mm -hmm. chunk has some statistics around it. You then use that to figure out what do, what do I even need to look at? Mm -hmm. And that general philosophy is called partitioning. Right? You see, you're partitioning data. Mm -hmm. You want to have the same idea, except now you're partitioning these vectors. So this these vectors are now in some space. And you want to kind of geometrically break down that space so that once you've broken down the space into geometric chunks of regions of space, when a query comes, you can say that, actually, you know what? I'm only interested in these regions. I don't care about data that's in all the other regions. Go to go fetch me only the parts of the index that belong in those regions. And then I'm going to see what are the closest candidates that uh, the query needs. So it is basically applying the same traditional partitioning ideas from databases, except for this new way of partitioning, which is geometry based, right? Interesting. So traditional databases don't understand geometry, right. but vector databases need to understand geometry. Right. Interesting. And so from the user perspective, I've got an existing Pinecone database. I've got documents in it. Um, you know, I've gone through the partitioning, uh, you know, strategy that you yeah. talked about earlier. And I hear about this announcement, I get excited and I want to take advantage of, you know, lower costs, all the, the things that you mentioned. Yeah. Does anything change for me? Do I flip a switch and all of a sudden I'm on the, the new, uh, the serverless or do I have to reload my data? And even that, you know, it's challenging at scale. Yeah. But maybe worse is do I have to touch my code? Do I have to, you know, re rewrite my application? Like what are the things that have yeah. to change from my perspective? That's a great question. So first of all, uh, so so today we are in what's called public preview. Okay. So during the public preview phase, you do have to re-ingest your data mm -hmm. if you want to use uh, serverless. Okay. Uh, between public preview and general availability, we're going to make it a, make it so that it's a flip a bit. So basically, sometime between now and when when we go uh, when we are generally available, mm -hmm. you shouldn't have to do anything to start taking advantage of serverless. But in this initial phase, you will have to re-ingest your data. There are no code changes involved for you. So uh, it should be seamless okay. from a code perspective to start using serverless. Okay. Now, uh, we also work uh, very closely with uh, some of our biggest customers who have billions of vectors. And for them, re-ingesting is not even an option. right? Mm -hmm. So for some of these customers who are trying out serverless, uh, our field engineering team and engineers work together to figure out an option for them to do a seamless migration. Okay. Uh, so there are things that we are doing to help some of the biggest use cases, but for uh, in in public preview, we did, uh, we uh, expect people to ingest their data today if they want to use serverless. From the perspective of a, a developer um, or uh, you know someone who's architecting one of these systems, it, it sounds like this changes a lot of the fundamental economics, and maybe I'm considering different use cases than I was previously, or I have, you know, fewer decisions that I have to make up front. 
Um, does API changes that go along with this? Is there, I guess I'm like trying to get at, are there new capabilities beyond, uh, you know, the, the things that are transparent to me that, uh, as a developer, I might get excited about. Absolutely. I think, uh, so first of all, uh, you're hundred percent, right. This, this unlocks some new use cases that people wouldn't be thinking about before, which is if you have data and you want to run on demand queries and mm-hmm. so on, you can now just start ingesting it because, uh, ingestion is cheap. Storage is cheap, and you're only paying for what you query. So this this really unlocks an entirely new set of use cases. Uh, alongside, we try not to break any APIs. Right, the whole uh, we are, we're trying to keep APIs as compatible as possible. But in serverless, you do get some extra information. Mm-hmm. For example, when you are using a serverless index, you're going to get information about, uh, in some sense, how much did this query cost. So mm-hmm. we have a proxy for this cost that we call read units. So every query returns to you what the cost of that query was. And now that's very useful for you to figure out, you know, in some sense to budget and to understand how much uh, is a use case pattern going to cost you, Mm -hmm. right? And that's very important to know. The same serverless architecture allows us to, uh, in some sense, put control over the amount of your data that you need to actually look at for the quality of search that you need. Uh, What I'm trying to say is that uh, it turns out most query sets and most experiments we've run and most benchmarks we've uh, we've uh, done, tell us that about 90, 95% of your queries can be answered by looking at a small amount of data. Okay. Okay. Uh, the trick is, of course, of course, figuring out what what is that small amount of data to look at, right? Which is also a traditional you know, database optimization type of a challenge, right? Exactly, exactly. Except it's it's a harder challenge for vector databases because you have to understand geometry. It's really geometry it's, and it's exactly, global right? as opposed to much more local. Exactly. Uh, but there are always these 5% of the queries that need to scan more. In our old pod-based architecture or in the in, in any other vector database today, every single query would be paying for the least common denominator, meaning mm-hmm. you, it would be as expensive for you to run a query that should have looked at a small amount of data as it is to run a query that should be looking at enough data to be able to answer your question, right? Mm-hmm. With serverless, you don't have to do that. So one of the things we are we are trying to do over the next uh, you know between now and general availability is figuring out how do what is the best API that we can give that puts this control in the hands of the users. Okay, mm-hmm. uh, I think this is going to be very powerful because now it allows you to be in control of just how much are you paying for a certain uh, what you consider good quality. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Maybe taking a step back to to where we started and. And kind of returning to to RAG and the challenges that that folks experience trying to get to you know a really quality production uh, yes. production quality experience for you know a user facing applications you know tie what you've done with serverless to to that core challenge and yeah. talk a little bit about what you see coming down the pike uh, that will make it easy because I, you know, it's got to get easier. It's, it's still very difficult. Absolutely. There's so much yeah. attention being paid to it. It yeah. will get easier. You know, yeah. how do you see it getting, getting easier and uh, you know, how will the vector database contribute yeah. to that? Yeah. I think, uh, you know, a lot of work that we've done over the last year has been to make the vector database really simple to use, really economical at scale and something that you can just throw your embeddings in and search over. And we are we are put a lot of effort into that. So Pinecone serverless is like a huge step in that direction, and I expect that we continue to double down on that and spend a lot of time refining that workflow. Now that said, so th- so I'm very confident that we do we'll do that really well, and we do that really well. But there is the other part of it, which is, you know, we talked about em- creating embeddings themselves as being complicated. We talked about chunking strategies themselves as being b- very much of an art than a science right now. Mm-hmm. We talked about very li- very little being done in the area of re-ranking and information retrieval itself to connect all of these together really well. Right. I expect that we'll find ourselves spending a lot of time making that workflow seamless and easy for people. Mm-hmm. So in some sense, I expect vector databases to really get to start kind of gluing together the areas around vector databases that uh, today are very disparate and bespoke. Yeah. Whether it is what embedding models you're using, what you know, what how you, how you're really chunking, versus what you're retrieving, how does that kind of get into 
the context of an LLM and so on. I think this is where a lot of engineering and research is going to happen over the next year, whether it's Spencone or anywhere else. Awesome. Awesome. Aram, thanks so much for taking some time out of your busy day to share with us kind of the latest and greatest with uh, regards to vector databases and, and RAG topics that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, are getting a lot of conversation, a lot of airplay here and elsewhere. Um, it's a great conversation. Thank you so much. And thanks for having me.